There's a debate I have fairly frequently that goes a little bit like this. Are new technologies the key to helping us tackle the major social problems we face in the world today? Or are they actually one of the main contributors to those very problems? It's a debate that probably goes back to the printing press, and one that seems to go in cycles of public opinion. Since the pandemic started, I've witnessed a definite shift towards more positive sentiment around technology, more discussion of how it's going to help us build a better world after COVID. Yet despite this shift, there still seems to be one technology largely missing from the conversation, one that has enormous potential to help influence social change. So today I want to talk to you about VR, or virtual reality, and the opportunities that I see it offering. Now, in a world where so many of us are spending a lot more time in digital spaces, it does seem strange that VR might still be being overlooked. However, in part, I think that's because we simply haven't taken it very seriously as a technology. If I were to guess what first came to your mind when I said virtual reality, I might think that it was video games or perhaps 3D movies. And those things are a little frivolous and a little prosaic. To put it into context, the first major at-home VR system was the Nintendo Power Glove back in 1989. And if I remember it correctly, it came with half a dozen games, including one I loved, where you were a magician that used the glove to cast spells. So I can certainly understand, at least for my generation, that VR would have these slightly silly childhood connotations, rather than coming to mind as a tool for social change. Except that games, because they're immersive, because they're interactive, actually have enormous power to shape our worldview. I've lived in London for 16 years now, and I still tend to view it as a giant monopoly board. And it's this ability to create spaces that help us rethink our own reality that keeps drawing me back to the potential of immersive art forms. Now that fascination didn't start with VR. In fact, my first great passion was the theatre. And when I was growing up, I had two ambitions. One, to be an actress, and two, to save the world. And that resulted in me creating these truly terrible plays that were about lecturing my parents and the neighbours to donate to charity. Uh, and unfortunately, at drama school, somebody introduced me to the ideas of Augusto Bowell, and in particular, Forum Theatre. And this is about creating a play around a social issue and then inviting the audience into the performance space to allow them to experiment with ways of dealing with that problem. And we use those ideas to create work about bullying, which are then toured around schools. And it was amazing to see the pupils developing their ability and their sense of agency to tackle a problem that was important to them and a lot more empowering and engaging than a play that simply told them what to do. And in VR, I see the chance to enhance and extend that same power that I first found in Forum Theatre. I'm not the only person excited about these opportunities either. The UN have been experimenting with VR resources, most notably in 2015, creating a piece called Clouds of a Sidra in partnership with the filmmaker Chris Milk. It's set in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, and in it you meet 12-year-old Sidra, who is a refugee from Syria. And she shows you around the camp, tells you about the people and places that are important to her, uh, and shares a little bit of her story. Milk has made his own talk about creating the piece, and what he had to say really resonated with my experiences of how VR creates more engagement and action. As an example, Clouds of Sidra was used in street fundraising for UNICEF, where it raised nearly $4 billion, almost twice as much as similar non-VR campaigns had raised in the past. And a lot of this difference was attributed to this idea of immersion, that because people were using a 360-degree headset to access the piece, they felt a sense of agency in the space. They were choosing where to look and which parts of Sidra's story to engage with. And that translated into them wanting to take action, in this case, to make a donation. As a film, however, Clouds Over Sidra only just begins to touch on the possibilities VR offers us as an immersive art form. Another example is the work of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University, which created a piece that allowed a virtual simulation of cutting down a redwood tree with a chainsaw. And as well as having a visual element with the headset, participants were also given wristbands that produced haptic vibrations that gave them a sense of the friction of the saw against the bark, as well as a headset that played a forest soundscape that was then shattered by the crash of the falling tree. And again, this experiment found a link between an immersive experience and behavioural change. Not only did the participants report having a more visceral understanding of what it would mean to cut down a tree as part of the papermaking process, but in a follow-up exercise, they were observed to use 20% less paper than a control group. 
So we can understand immersion as the first of three key affordances to help us make sense of VR as a tool for social change. And affordance is a concept I find really useful in analysing all kinds of technology. Put simply, it's what that technology allows or encourages you to do based on its innate attributes or characteristics. So a pencil enables you to share certain kinds of messages by allowing you to write. And VR encourages you to make behavioural and therefore social change by allowing you to become an actor rather than a spectator of a social problem. Now, the second key affordance, I believe, is embodiment. In the examples I've given so far, the VR is still asking you to identify as yourself, whether you're visiting the refugee camp or cutting down a redwood. And that means you're coming from an external compassionate viewpoint, that it makes you want to help somebody or something else. But VR also quite uniquely allows us to identify with another by quite literally letting us put ourselves in their shoes. Take, for example, the work of artist Lucy Bonner, and particularly her piece Compliment, which aimed to raise awareness about street harassment. Based on her own experiences living in New York, which rather sadly resonated with some of mine living in London, she aimed to show how violating the experience of being catcalled could really be, particularly for those who might otherwise dismiss it as a compliment. Now, these were often individuals who felt physically dominant in their day-to-day -day lives, and so the VR work to disrupt this feeling. As the recipient of the cat calling, your perspective is set rather low, and that allows the other characters to really loom in and invade your screen, creating that palpable sense of threat and intimidation. That's not a perspective everyone would have been able to imagine, but having had it materialised for them, they have got able to access the experience and the feelings it provokes, and perhaps use this as a basis for behavioural change. So this ability to jump the imagination gap between ourselves and another suggests that VR is also capable of giving us an empathetic mindset based on self-identification with an issue. Now, that distinction between compassion and empathy may be becoming increasingly important in a world where it seems that compassion fatigue is growing, perhaps based on a sense of overwhelming problems in the world and the need to have a bit of an emotional defence mechanism. So if embodiment can both give us a sense of identification with an issue, as well as the belief that our actions are creating real change, it can become increasingly important for those advocating for a cause. Therefore, it's no surprise that there's a small but growing trend of charities and campaign organisations creating embodiment-based VR, whether that's disability rights organisations giving us a colourblind perspective of the classroom, or perhaps an animal welfare campaigning group letting us see the eyes through the eyes of a cow in a slaughterhouse. Now that last example brings me to the third key affordance, which I think is transcendence. Because as well as allowing us access to hidden spaces, VR lets us overcome boundaries of time, space and risk to give entrance into hidden spaces as well. For example, another of my great passions is wildlife photography, but it's a hobby I had to be careful with because viewing animals in the wild means I'm encroaching on their habitat and potentially putting undue stress on their ecosystems. I met this chap in the Bawindi Impenetrable Forest, and as the name suggests, it is not the most accessible area. As well as the geographical challenges, there's periodic civil unrest in the region, and in the wake of COVID, calls to further restrict future tourism over concerns of disease transmission between humans and gorillas. Yet the tours in this area provide incentive for conservation, particularly as former poachers are retrained as tour guides. So a number of organisations have been working with the Rwanda Development Board to create VR gorilla safaris. They still give people the chance to meet these magnificent creatures in the wild and encourage investment in local conservation, whilst removing the risks and repercussions of having people physically present in the forest. Virtual spaces also allow us to go beyond simply recreating a location and lets us give access to additional context, such as the histories or stories that have shaped a space. Whilst I was studying in Australia, I had the chance to be involved in a workshop with Indigenous filmmakers who were looking at how to reclaim landscapes from colonial narratives. And as part of this, they were investigating using VR in tourist centres so that people could experience cultural landmarks, such as Uluru, through Indigenous perspectives rather than by visiting and potentially damaging or desecrating sites that were considered sacred. Unfortunately, I had to return to the UK before I could be further involved, but I've been so excited to see the fruition of projects coming from a similar mindset, such as the work of Rhett Laban at the University of New South Wales. 
His piece, The Torres Strait Virtual Reality, lets people experience these unique Australasian islands and their flora and fauna, whilst being guided by the stories and navigation systems of the indigenous Torres Strait Islanders, a perspective they might not otherwise have been able to get. So a whirlwind tour of different examples there, and one that hopefully gives you just a glimpse of the hidden potential of VR and its three key affordances for social change. Immersion to create agency, embodiment to invoke empathy, and transcendence to allow us access to hidden spaces. And wherever you fall in the technology debate, I'm hoping there's at least something there that gets you excited about VR and its potential. However, I'm not overlooking you if you feel that you fall on the other side of the debate, that technology causes more problems than it solves. Because here's the really crucial thing about affordances. They're not neutral. Now, neither are they good or bad by default, but instead they shape and are shaped by the society around them. So acquiring a pencil may change the kind of messages that you're able to write, but there are so many other factors that will influence what you choose to say. It's the same with VR. In fact, I don't believe any technology by itself is going to help us solve any of our social problems, but I do believe they can be part of the solution if we use them correctly. In order to do that, we need to understand how each of their affordances could cause harm if used in the wrong way. Whilst my research has focused on the experience of a number of marginalised groups and their use of VR, I've taken a particular interest in how it's been used in mental health. And that's because as an individual, my identity has been significantly shaped by living with a long-term mental health disability. That's allowed me to be part of projects looking at using virtual reality as an educational and anti-stigma tool. In doing so, one key risk that I've observed is that by allowing us to transcend boundaries, VR also allows us to violate spaces. The process of oppressing any group often involves occupying and rewriting their lived experience. And as any number of overly negative and inaccurate portrayals of mental ill health, frequently written by people that just don't have the experience to know. I'd be horrified to see any of those becoming the basis for a voyeuristic VR experience. So we need to start by ensuring that VR users are invited in rather than trespassing. And that means making sure resources are made by, or at the very least with, people that have the legitimacy and the experience to really share a perspective on an issue. Unfortunately, by being marginalised, such groups are often on the wrong side of the digital divide. So to tackle that challenge, we need to be talking about access rights and disenfranchisement. Without that, any sense of identification or participation that VR offers will be illegitimate and potentially counterproductive. There's also the fact that even amongst people with lived experience, there's really just one viewpoint on an issue. A project I was involved in looking at a VR experience of psychosis quickly stalled due to arguments around the use of medicalised terminology, a key debate for many mental health rights activists. And that showed me that VR can be a poor choice for a contentious issue because embodiment lends itself to seeing just to a single viewpoint, whilst at the same time immersion helps remove the cues that remind us to keep a critical distance on an issue. Because for all its sense of immediacy and presence, we have to remind ourselves that VR is scripted and created with an agenda, just like any other art form. So we need to be asking questions and making sure that that doesn't replace conversation, or in fact, disagreement. Finally, there's the fact that we're unsure about the significance or the longevity of the empathy effect. Often, research into social impact has looked at small or short-term behavioural changes amongst new or inexperienced users. But research from a slightly different area, looking at VR as a mental health therapeutic tool, suggests that repeatedly immersing people into the same experience desensitises them to that experience. This suggests that we need to be doing a lot more research to understand how VR affects our emotions long term so that we don't oversaturate people and therefore end up provoking more compassion fatigue than we tackle. So, understanding VR from our affordances perspective as our co-creator of change, it's clear there's some questions we need to be asking to make sure we maximise its positive potential and minimise the negative. We need to know whose perspectives are being prioritised where the funding is coming from to create a resource, and who is holding the overall balance of power in the making of VR. And I think now is a critical time to be asking those questions, because for a long time now, VR has stayed in the sweet spot of becoming increasingly affordable and accessible, whilst not quite having the mainstream success that would have led to it being monopolised. And that means plenty of people have had the chance to create and experiment and research in relative freedom. 
but we've come a long way since the power glove, and I don't think that VR is going to be overlooked for that much longer. In fact, just a few years ago, Facebook bought Oculus, makers of one of the most popular VR headsets, and there's another, a number of other major companies who are increasing their investment in the technology. And I think that means the balance of power may soon be about to shift. So what does this mean for the future of VR as a social change tool? Well, in true forum theatre style, I'd like to throw that answer back to you. I'd like you to think of a technology that you think has either significantly contributed to or alleviated a social problem, whether that's nuclear power plants or social media or indeed the printing press. And now I'd like you to imagine that you were there when that technology was being developed and you'd had your chance to have a say. Would you have been one of the early internet advocates, writing its manifesto of open access and radical politics? Or would you have been an industrial revolution naysayer, demanding that your organisation think about its unintended consequences? Or are both of those hopelessly naive perspectives, would you have done something more pragmatic? Whatever your answer to that is, I now want you to think how you could apply it to VR while it still is in those developing stages. Go out there and experiment with using it any way you can find it. Ask those questions about access and about agendas and make sure that you're holding people to account. If you have an important perspective to share, experiment with what you can create. Or if not, make sure that you're supporting other creators. Because above all, the answer to how VR will create social change is it depends on how it's used by people like you. Thank you.